Hey everyone, welcome back to Power Electronics. Today we're going to be looking deeper into the flyback converter. So last time we talked about the flyback transformer, and that was absolutely necessary to understand how this converter works. So just to remind you, the flyback transformer is a little, a little bit different than a conventional transformer, right? So basically the main difference is we can store energy in a flyback transformer. What this means is that we use the energy we use the flyback transformer as an inductor and a transformer together. And this is really like the main important point. So maybe you could think of, about a flyback transformer as like a two winding inductor, right? Where you can kind of put energy or take energy out from either winding. Maybe that's a, a better way of thinking about it. So again, basically because we can store energy in a flyback transformer, current isn't always flowing in both, uh, both windings at the same time. That, and that's basically the main difference. Right, so in one portion of time, current will flow in one winding and not the other, and then vice versa in the other portion of time. So let's look at the flyback transformer. So what, do, what does it look like? Well, we have our input, which is connected directly to the flyback or the flyback transformer, which is then connected to a switch, right? A power MOSFET in this case. There are other options you could choose, of course. And I'm going to include the magnetizing inductance. I'm going to draw the magnetizing inductance explicitly so we can see kind of where the current flows. And this is coupled to a secondary side, right? So this is the primary side and this is the secondary side, right? And we have a diode, which is then connected to the output. Right, so this doesn't have to be a diode, right? We, we could implement this with a MOSFET, but we do need this to be some kind of controlled device. This can't really just be a diode, right? We have to control when we charge, when we put energy into the transformer, and we do that by controlling the on time of the switch, right? So we have VG, we have V out, and we also have a, uh, we have our magnetizing inductance, LM. We have our output capacitor, C out. We have our MOSFET, I'll call Q, and our diode, D. And we're just gonna analyze this as we would analyze a normal converter, right? We're actually gonna look at both CCM and DCM operation really quickly. Cool, so how does it work? Well, how do we analyze this? We analyze it in the same way we analyze any other converter. So, for CCM, for continuous conduction mode, i.e. the magnetizing current in the transformer, right, ILM, does not go to zero and stay at zero, or does not go flat. It's always changing, you could say. That's continuous conduction mode. So we have two time intervals, one between zero and DTS, and the other between DTS and the end of the switching cycle, right? So usually we call this D, and we call this D prime, right? So what does it look like in the first switching interval? Well, again, we have our input, our primary winding, and here the MOSFET is on, right? We're, we're turning it on. We have our magnetizing inductance and then our output. And as I'm drawing this now, I realize I forgot to indicate what the transformer dots and one and turns ratio were. So there's a lot of ways to define this. I'm just gonna do it in the easiest way by making one of the turns one and the other n. So I'm gonna say this is a one to n transformer. And depending on what you wanna do, maybe it's n to one, could be a lot of things. And then most importantly, the dots are flipped, right? So we have one dot on one side and one dot on the other side. So these windings are 
wound in opposite directions, right? So the flux induces opposite voltages in them. And that's important for operation. So again, we have one to n, and we have one dot on one side and one dot on the other side. And in the secondary side, because of these dots, the diode is forced off, right? And we have the output connected to the load, right? So this is, it's forced off because basically we're applying a positive voltage here. And because of the opposite winding, we apply a positive voltage in this direction, right? Which, if you think about this being a positive output voltage, then we apply a negative voltage, which reverse biases the diode, forcing it off. That is why the dots have to be in this direction. Okay, and on the second side, second interval, we have our input again. And this time Q is off. We still have our magnetizing inductance. We still stored energy in the core, which we represent with this inductor, right, in quotes, which is then connected to the secondary side, right? And in this case, the diode is forced on. Why is it forced on? Well, consider, so first let's think about the turns ratio and of the dots. Consider the current flowing in LM, right? So we have LM, I'll just label everything first. LM, C out, C out. We have Q over here, we have Q over here, we have D over here, we have D over here. Right, consider the current flowing in LM, right? So in this interval, we've established it in this direction. It continues to flow in that direction, except now there is no path for the current to flow in this loop, meaning ILM must flow through the winding. And again, because of the way we've uh, chosen to wind this transformer, typically what we say is that if current is flowing out of the dot on one side, it must flow into the dot on the other side, right? So it's flowing, it must flow out of this dot on the primary side, which means it flows into the, into the dot on the secondary side, which as a result forward biases the diode D. Cool, and we'll, and we'll, we'll look in, into that a little bit more deeply. So let's just label some voltages and currents, right? So we're gonna have VLM over here. And again, ILM, we're defining it to flow in this in this direction, passive sign convention. And we're gonna have, again, this is V out over here, which is the same voltage across the output capacitor. And we'll define the output or the capacitor current ICO in this direction. Again, following passive sign convention. And again, VLM over here, ILM and V out. And again, the current through the capacitor. And let's also consider the, the voltage across the diode, VD, ID, VD, ID, and through the, the switch. So we have IQ and VQ, and we have VQ and IQ. Cool. So we have basically everything labeled. And now we'll, all we have to do is apply IVSB and CCB. Again, we, with the flyback transformer, we only have really two elements we have to consider to find the conversion ratio, right? That is VLM, right? So we do IVSB. So we consider VLM in the first interval. In this case, it is going to be VG, right? Because VQ is zero when the switch is on. And that the only other voltage source in this loop is VG. So VLM in the first interval is VG. VLM in the second inter interval well, this is where we have to do a little bit of thinking, right? So what we assume is that there are no other parasitics, which means that the voltage across the transistor, VQ, when it shuts off, instantly goes up to VG, right? It becomes a little bit different in different circumstances and is basically just not true in real life. However, we're going to assume here that VQ is equal to VG in this case, right? It's, it's an open circuit which means that the only voltage that can be across VLM, right, because we have VG over here, and when this rises up to VG, so 
these voltages cancel out. So in the second subinterval, we have to think a little bit, right? So there are no non-idealities in the circuit, and VQ, we don't really know what VQ is. So right, so we, we could say that the voltage again across VLM is equal to VG minus VQ, but what is VQ? Well, it's a little bit hard to see from the primary side, so instead, what we can equivalently do is think about the voltage across the secondary side. Right, the voltage that is, that is applied to the secondary winding, and then reflect that back to the primary side to find the voltage across VLM. Right, so that's what we're going to do. So the voltage across the primary side, again, assuming the diode is forward biased, the voltage across the primary or secondary side must be V out. So we have the secondary voltage V sec is equal to V out. And if we reflect that back to the primary side, then the primary voltage, or VLM in this case, really, is just going to be V out over N, right? And that and that's just from V1 over V2 is equal to N1 over N2. In this case, N1 is one, and N2 is just N, right? So V1, the voltage on the primary, must be equal to V2 divided by N. So the voltage across VLM in the second half, right, in D prime, is equal to, well, the magnitude is V out over N. However, the dots flip the voltage, right? So we actually apply minus V out over N in the second interval, right? So we apply some voltage here that is reflected and flipped, the polarity is flipped, and we discharge the magnetizing inductance effectively through the output. That, that's what this is saying. Cool. Next, we look at the output capacitor, right? And I'll just use IC out. So in the first subinterval, the diode is off. The only current that can flow out of the capacitor or flow through the capacitor at all is the output current, right? So in this case, this is our load. The only current in this loop is V out over our load. We've established some voltage and there's a resistor. The current flowing here is V out over our load meaning ICO is equal to the negative of that, right? Just based on the direction of these currents, the way I've defined it. So it's equal to minus V out over our load. In the second subinterval, well, in this case, we have we do have some current flowing, right? We have some current flowing from the primary side, from, v, from LM. We have ILM flowing through the primary winding, and it flows through the secondary winding. So, on the one side, again, we still have this V out over R load. So I'm going to include minus V out over R load. And then we have the reflected current, right? So we've established ILM over here. And that is reflected to the secondary side with the polarity reversed. So we can assume, again, the current flows in this direction to forward bias the diode. And the current must then be related to ILM. Well, how is it related to ILM? Well, we have N1 I1 is equal to N2 I2. In this case, N1 is 1. N2 is just N. I1 is ILM, which means that I2, the current flowing here, must be equal to ILM over N. Right? So that means that the current flowing in the capacitor is the difference between this magnetizing inductor current and the output current. In other words, we have ILM over N minus V out over our load. And that's basically it, right? That th those are the the two states we're interested in. So we can we can solve this directly, right? We we can quite simply do actually do IVSB and CCB. So this is CCB. So let, let's do the equations. We we did the voltages and currents, let's do the equations. So for IVSB we have D times VG plus D prime minus V out over N. And that is equal to zero. Right, so solving for this, right, we can quite simply solve for this. We have DVG is equal to D prime V out over N. And again, simplifying, we have V out over VG, right, so I just brought this over here, is equal to D over 
d prime. And there's an n here, so we have n d over d prime is the conversion ratio. So this is m of d. And we can also find the uh, the magnetizing inductor current, right? So we have d times minus v out over our load plus D plus D prime plus D prime ILM over N, right? And again, I, I we're not assuming small ripple approximation for ILM, but in this case, we're considering the average of ILM, which we can do. So I'll just write the average of ILM minus V out over our load, right? And that is equal to zero. So simplifying, again, we can solve this directly. We have D prime ILM over n, and I'm just going to bring these two terms, which are the same, you know, if d plus d prime is 1, is equal to v out over our load. And then simplifying again, we have ilm is equal to n v out over d prime our load. Cool. So, those are the two like the two things we're interested in, the two state variables, average state variables, we could say. Next, what we want to do is look at the waveforms. Okay, so first, what do we do? We draw VLM. Now we want to look at the waveforms. So what do we draw? We draw the voltage across the inductor. Then we draw the current through the inductor, right? So this is VLM, and this is going to be ILM, right? And then from there, we can draw the capacitor current. And then finally, we can draw what the output voltage looks like. So again, we have ICO, and then finally, the waveform of V of T. So right, these are all functions of T. You were, so we solved the we found the DC solution and now we're finding the uh, the time varying solution or what the steady state looks like. So again, we have two sub intervals. Right, so we have TS. This is all time. DTS over here. So in the first subinterval, we have VG across the inductor, right? VG. In the second subinterval, we have minus V out over N. We know what the average inductor current is. It is equal to V out or NV out over D prime R load, right? We just found that. That's the average. And then we're superimposing, you could say the ripple over the inductor current, right? So in the first subinterval, it's rising up, right? With a slope of VG over LM. In the second subinterval, it's discharging with a slope of minus V out over N LM. Right? Looks pretty standard for now. The output current. Okay, well, the output current in the first subinterval, we just have minus V out over our load. And again, we could rewrite this in terms of ILM, but, or we could rewrite this, but for now, this is what it is. So we have minus V out over our load in the first subinterval. And in the second subinterval, we have. ILM over N, so some scaled version, right? ILM over N minus V over our load. So what do we do? We take a copy of this. We take a copy of ILM. We divide it by N. And then we shift it down by V over our load. So it's going to look something like this, right? So this has some slope. You don't really need to worry about it for now. This is basically the shape that it looks like. Finally, from this, from this picture, we're just going to sketch out what V out looks like, right? So we know what the average is. It's, well, V out, which is equal to N D over T prime V G. It's one way of writing it. In the first subinterval, we're 
actually decreasing, right? We're discharging the output capacitor. So the output voltage is decreasing. And then in the second sub interval, we have the maximum slope in the first part, and then that maximum slope slowly decreases. So we're gonna have some, I'll, I'll draw it evenly across this. So we have some maximum slope over here, and then that slope slowly dies down. So what this actually looks like is going to depend on how big your components are, right? So if you have a really big capacitor, then that, uh, or if you have a really large magnetizing inductance, then this slope might not be so big, which means that this curvature might not be so big. However, if the inductor is smaller, then this slope is gonna be larger, and maybe it'll go even below zero a little bit, in which case this slope or this curvature will increase, right? So this curvature, is related to the inductor or the inductance, right? We don't really have an inductor, we have a flyback transformer, it's just related to the inductance of that flyback transformer. Cool, so using this, we can actually size stuff, right? We can figure out how big the output capacitor should be and how big the magnetizing inductance should be, right? So magnetizing inductance is pretty simple, right? So we have VG over LM, we can say that this is, if we wanna find delta IL, delta ILM is just going to be one half, well, DTS times VG over LM, right? Pretty straightforward. We, we can figure out what, uh, we can size LM with this equation, right? VG DTS over two delta ILM, right? And this delta ILM is really the average to peak ripple. That's what we want. And then over here, it's going to depend a little bit, but first approximation, we can figure out what the Right, this slope is actually V out over R load times C out basically divided by C out, or we can think about the charge, right? The charge that we have here. So delta Q in this case is equal to D T S times V out over R load. Right? And then we have Q is equal to C V, which means that well, we can say that delta Q is equal to C delta V. So we have to be a little bit careful here with this equation, right? So this, if we're thinking about this Q here, then the variation in voltage that we're gonna see is actually from the maximum to the minimum, which is twice what we want, right? Usually we refer to the average to the minimum ripple. So in this case, this equation, what it's actually saying is two delta V out, is going to be equal to delta Q over C out. And then delta Q, again, we, we've already solved for it, is DTS V out over our load. And we have C out over here. And then we can replace V out, right? We can replace V out with the, uh, the equation, right? This thing is equal to N D over D prime VG, right? So, two delta V out, and again, you can solve for this yourself. This is not that difficult. I'm just doing it very quickly here. Two delta V out is equal to, well, we have N D squared over D prime VG over C out R load. And then we have, I'm just gonna put FS, the switching frequency in the bottom, All right? That That's pretty much what the uh, output voltage ripple expression is. This is how you would size C out. You, you can rearrange this for C out. Right, so it's load dependent, that kind of makes sense. Cool. So that is uh, CCM, right? That's what's going on in CCM. We charge up the, you know, let's, let's just, uh, right? So we, we charge up the inductor, the magnetizing inductance in the first switching cycle. No current flows in the secondary because the diode is reverse biased. Then when we turn off the switch, when we turn off Q, the current is forced to go through the secondary because there is no more path in the primary side and that goes to the output. And then if we operate in CCM, what we see is a conversion ratio of ND over D prime. So this is like a buck boost type converter, right? It's like a buck boost. In fact, it is derived from a buck boost with, with a turns ratio, with turns ratio. If I'm not mistaken, flyback transformers are generally 
used up to say like 200 watts, maybe a little bit higher, but typically they're not really used for super high, high power applications. These are mostly lower power stuff. And just for reference, toaster is about a kilowatt, right? So this is like less power than a toaster, you could say. Uh, yeah, so it's it's used for maybe lower power applications. Um, yeah, so that's in CCM. And then we can also look in DCM, right? So maybe maybe what I should do is uh, go over here. So this is for CCM. And if we want to think about DCM, all we have to do is include a third interval. And it totally changes everything about the conversion ratio, right? So this, this would be like uh, D2TS up to the end of the switching cycle, right? So this, this would kind of translate to D1TS to D2TS, right? And then we have a third interval, which is where everything is off, right? So this is where all the elements are off, right? So in this third interval, we assume that the inductor current has gone to zero, right? That's what... DCM really means the inductor current is flat. There's no slope, right? And both the diode and the switch are off, right? So this is uh, LM. Yeah, we can BLM. ILM is zero in this case. We have one to N. The dots are on opposite sides. Well, we have C out, I out, and this is again V out. Great, so this is pretty similar. And really to understand what's going on, we should draw the waveforms. I'm just gonna draw them directly, right? So in the first sub-interval, let's, uh, you know, let's just go down a little bit. So in the first sub-interval, it basically operates the same, right? So we have, D1, D2, and D3, right? So this is D1. This is D1 plus D2. And this is the end of the switching cycle, TS, right? And here we're looking at VLM, right? So in the first subinterval, we apply VG, right? That's normal. In the second sub-interval, again, we apply V out minus V out over N, and this fully discharges the, the inductor, right? So the inductor current goes to zero and stuff switches off. So this is minus V out over N, and then because everything is off, the voltage we apply is zero, right? Cool. So then what, what happens to the current? So now we have the inductor current. The inductor current, or the inductance current, the flyback transformer current, looks triangular now, right? Because it starts and ends at zero, right? So the ILM, we charge it up with a slope of VG over LM. We discharge it with a slope of minus VO over N LM, and then it stays at zero, right? And we apply no voltage, right? This is what the inductor current looks like. Then we can think about the output capacitor current. Right, so, well, the diode only conducts in the second sub-interval, right? So we, we can think about IC out. In the first sub-interval, the current flowing to the cap, or flowing through the cap is really just the output current. Right, so we, we have the same kind of thing, minus V out over our load. In the third sub-interval, everything's off, so again, all we have is minus V out over our load. And then in the second sub-interval, right, where the diode is conducting, this is when we see this magnetizing current flow, right? So basically, we again, we, we see a copy of this current flow through the secondary winding, right, and into the output. So what I'm just going to do is superimpose this this negative triangular current over this interval, right? So basically we inject some current over here, right? This triangle. 
this is the current we send to the output, right? And to be more explicit, we can say that the the diode current, let's uh, let's just do it below. The diode current, the current flowing to the output, the one we're interested in, is a scaled copy, right? A reflected copy of the magnetizing inductance current, right? So this is what the diode current looks like. And again, with this, with uh, DCM, the trick is really to, to solve these circuits is to find the current that's flowing to the output and relate that to the average output, uh, uh, the average output current, right? So this is the current flowing to the output, right? This is like, uh, this is like delta Q out, the current that we send to the output, the area under this curve. And we know that I out, the only way that this thing gets current, the, the only way there is output current is the current coming through the diode. This is equal to the average diode current, right? Which is incidentally equal to delta Q over TS. So the goal here to solve this circuit, to figure out what the conversion ratio is, is really to find what delta Q out is, right? So what is this? Well, it's a, it's a triangle. So delta Q out. What is delta Q out? It's the area under the triangle. Right, so it must be equal to half the base. The base in this case, this length of time is equal to D2TS. So D2TS times the height. What is this height? Well, this is a scaled version of the magnetizing inductance current, right? So it's related to ILM. Right, this peak, I'll call it ILM peak. It's related to this, but how? Well, we reflect it from the primary to the secondary, right? So we have N1 I1 is equal to N2 I2. We're looking for I2. N1 is 1, and N2 is N, right? So N1 over N, or ILM over N, is equal to I2, the secondary current. So that means we basically just have to divide this by N. So delta Q is equal to half D2TS times ILM peak over N. Well, what is ILM peak? It's simply this current, right? And we can find this because it starts at zero. This current starts at zero. We apply a a positive voltage, a constant voltage for a specific period of time. So ILM peak is equal to D1 TS times VG over LM. So just rewriting delta Q, we have half D2 TS. And then ILM peak is just D1 TS VG over LM. And then we have this extra term of N. Right, so we're almost there. Well, right now we kind of still have an equation. Well, we have one equation with D1T2 at TS, and we also have to do some extra stuff. So we have I out is equal to the average of ID. This, it turns out, is equal to, well, just the charge over one switching cycle, right? So one over TS times delta Q. Delta Q is one over two D2TS times D1TS VG over N L M. Great. We can cancel out one of these TSs, right? And we're almost there. Turns out I out is all also equal to V out over R load, right? So we're just coming up with different expressions for I out and stuff. So to simplify this equation, I'm just gonna bring V out over VG onto one side, right? So V out over VG. So I bring this V out over to this side, VG, I divide by VG. And I'll bring R load over to the top, right? So R load comes over here. We have D2, D1, TS, R load over N, 2, LM. Right, and you, you can you can verify that for yourself, but one thing you can notice is that we have this term 2L over RTS, which is what we expect when we go into DCM.
right? This, this term shows up every time we go into DCM, right? This is our, our K crit or related to K. It's our K and our K crit is related to this. So what do we got? Well, we're almost there, but we still have D1 and D2. Where do we get the other D1 and D2? Well, that's from IVSB, right? IVSB tells us that we have D1 VG plus D2 times minus V out over N plus D3 times zero is equal to zero, right? Because in the third subinterval, everything's off and the voltage applied to the, uh, to the inductance is zero. What this says is that D1 VG is equal to D2 V out over N. In other words, simplifying, we have D2. We usually want to get rid of D2 because it's an uncontrolled variable, right? We control D1 and then D2 is kind of however long it takes for the inductor to discharge. So we eliminate D2. D2 is equal to D1 VG N over V out, right? I just divided. Finally, we can simplify this, right? We can throw all this back into here, right? So this, this equation, we can stick it into here. So what do we get? We get V out over VG is equal to, in brackets, D1 VG N over V out times D1 TS over R load N 2 LM. Awesome. Almost there. So we have a few more simplifications we could do, right? So this thing, this is our conversion ratio, or the inverse of our conversion ratio, and I want to bring it over to the other side. This N we have here cancels with this N, and then these D1s combine. So simplifying again, V out over VG squared, right, because I brought this over, is equal to D1 squared times TS R load over 2LM, right? Because we eliminated the turns ratio. So when you operate the flyback in DCM, the turns ratio disappears, right? The output voltage doesn't depend on the turns ratio or the conversion ratio doesn't depend on the turns ratio anymore, which is very interesting. So we're almost there. We can simplify by simply taking the square root. This is a non-inverting converter, although you could arrange it so that it was inverting. However, it's not. We're in this case, we're assuming it's non-inverting. So when we take square roots both sides, which is what we're going to do, we're gonna take the positive solution, right? And that's not really gonna bother us too much. So what do we get? We get V out over VG, which is the conversion ratio in DCM, which it turns out is a function of D and our variable K, 2L, 2LM over RTS, is equal to D1, and then we have this term. So this is actually the inverse of K. It's equal to one over K. So substituting this back in, we have one over root K, right? Because we took the square root. So it's really D1 over root K. And this is exactly the conversion ratio of a buck boost in DCM. But you have isolation, right? Super cool. So this is what we get. And it is kind of what you expect. It's derived from a buck boost. You end up getting a buck boost. And this is basically how you solve it, right? So this is just like the, the DC solution. Next, what we're going to do, like after this, the next lecture, we're going to add some non-idealities. And the specific non-ideality non we're going to include is actually the leakage inductance. Right, so we, we had to include the magnetizing inductance because that's how this thing operates. In this, for the flyback, the magnetizing inductance isn't a parasitic or anything, it's how it works. But now we're going to include the leakage and we'll see what an important part of the operation this leakage inductance is, right? It really determines what kind of components you're gonna use. And we'll, we'll see why, right? Basically we store some energy in the leakage and that energy has to go somewhere and it can 
negatively impact your circuit. That energy can actually destroy the switch specifically if you're not careful. So we'll get to that later, but right now this is really just going over the operation of the flyback converter in detail. Uh, I hope it was clear, and if you have any questions, please ask. I'll see you guys next time.